Okay, so thanks, Shumilan. So I would first like to thank the organizers for organizing this nice meeting and also for inviting me to be here. Uh, sorry for this rather long title, because when I received the original email from them, it said that it will be a one-hour seminar-style talk, but uh, that's why I gave a slightly longish title. Uh, but I'll finish in 30 minutes. <laughs> right. Okay. So uh, the story here is uh, what happens when you disorder certain kinds of spin liquid states. And here the spin liquid state where I would uh, show the analysis is uh, a very well understood uh, classical spin liquid. And when you put disorder in it, it gives rise to a very unusual state of matter, which has both glass degrees of freedom and liquid degrees of freedom coexisting with each other, and so hopefully you'll find some of it interesting. Okay, and uh, uh, at any point in the talk, if something is unclear, please stop me and I'll try to answer. Okay, good. So before I start, I would like to acknowledge my collaborators. So much of the work has really been possible due to this very smart postdoc of mine, Tushar Kanti Bose, and I have also benefited a lot with discussions with Roderick Moisner at MPI PKS. And uh, uh, in this series of work, I have also collaborated a bit with uh, Shivaji Sondi and Wojcik Kayser, but I'll just mention their work very briefly here. And uh, towards the end of the talk, if time permits, I'll also discuss some of the ongoing work, but uh, uh, some of it has already been published in these two references. Okay, so then since it's the first talk, I can show a couple of basic slides, uh, but I'll be sort of brief. Uh, so, so the first question is, what is a spin liquid? So this name or this term spin liquid, uh, the historical uh, uh, sort of uh, thing here was in close analogy to a solid or a liquid or a gas state of matter and the sort of uh, things related to that in spin systems. So just like a crystalline solid, you can imagine that a spin solid is a state of matter which breaks certain long-range symmetries and therefore have uh, low-lying goldstone modes according to that. So for example, in a regular solid, you have uh, phonon modes. And similarly, in a spin solid, you have spin waves or magnon modes. And these are also very clearly seen in experiments. And uh, in cases when the low temperature physics is that of an ordered magnet, much of the physics can be understood just by thinking of these uh, uh, low temperature goldstone wave excitations. Okay? So then what may be a spin gas? Again, like a conventional gas, a spin gas is something where the spins are totally uncorrelated and each spin is doing its own fluctuations and doesn't care too much about the neighboring spins. And by the same token, one might believe that a spin liquid is basically something which is not a spin solid, so it doesn't have some broken long-range symmetry. Uh, and similarly, it's not a spin gas in the sense that it's not an uncorrelated paramagnet, but then the best you can do like that is something called a strongly correlated paramagnet. Okay? But this doesn't immediately convey what is the most exciting bit for a spin liquid. So in my opinion, the thing which is really interesting here is that the, even though the ground state breaks no long-range symmetries and therefore doesn't have Goldstone modes, in fact, the excitations here are completely different to normal conventional phases of matter and uh, carry different quantum numbers. Okay? So one simple example of that is, suppose I start with a Heisenberg spin chain in 1D with spin half degrees of freedom. Then uh, it's well known, at least in this problem, because this one can solve exactly by Bethe answers, that the excitations are not magnon-like. They are, in fact, spin-on-like. So if you wish, uh, um, uh, the magnon is like your more conventional spin wave excitation, whereas a spin-on is a fraction of a spin wave. Okay? Right. So then one might ask, what's the diagnostics of such a spin, uh, spin liquid state in an experiment? So as I already said, uh, these are states which sort of resist conventional order. So if you probe something like a magnetic susceptibility, so then at high temperature, you might see that, okay, there is a finite Curie-wise temperature for these kinds of states. But nonetheless, if you keep decreasing your temperature much below the Curie-wise temperature, there is no, uh, no long-range order which sets up in the system. On the other hand, if you look at other 
uh, indicators like the spin correlations or the excitations or the effects of disorder in the system, then you notice that things are very non-trivial. For example, uh, this is actually the spin structure factor in momentum space for the spin liquid that I'm going to talk about, which is also called the Coulomb spin liquid in the community. And uh, basically the important thing here is that unlike a ferromagnet or an antiferromagnet, these points here in momentum space are not Bragg spots, so they don't identify any long range ordering. Rather, if you actually see carefully, if you move in different directions in momentum space, you realize that uh, these are points of discontinuity in momentum space, and these are called pinch points, and uh, uh, basically that signifies that the spin-spin correlations in real space are uh, long range and uh, uh, actually don't uh, develop a, uh, 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 are actually algebraic and don't develop a long range order, okay? So, uh, again, in these, uh, so if you again go to a lab and take some lattice where you suspect that there is a spin liquid, most of the times what happens here is that as you keep cooling the system, eventually there is a thermodynamic phase transition and you might notice some other phase which takes over. And this phase is normally a spin glass phase. Uh, however, this spin glass phase uh, where the parent state was a spin liquid is typically very unusual. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Uh, so what I mean by that is that uh, there are simultaneous degrees of freedom here which are uh, slow degrees of freedom and there are other degrees of freedom which are fast degrees of freedom. So in a glass you would always expect slow degrees of freedom, that's why it's called a glass. But uh, the interesting bit here is that there are these other degrees of freedom floating around which are really fluctuating strongly in time. Okay, so uh, here I just show one experiment, but there are lots of experiments actually, where uh, you can see the signature that there is a glass phase below a certain uh, transition temperature because uh, basically the data using zero field cooled and field cooled studies start diverging below a certain temperature, which sort of signifies a diverging time scale in the, in the system. Uh, and this experiment in particular is on a spin half Kagome antiferromagnet where again we believe that there is a spin liquid phase at least at uh, uh, temperatures which are not too low, okay. Uh, another very well known example in the community is, these, uh, is this compound called SCGO in short where the spin degrees of freedom are actually spin 3 half. So they can be thought more in a classical manner because the spin quantum number is higher but even here uh, even though the Curie-wise temperature, so the scale, if you wish, uh, of the coupling in your spin Hamiltonian is rather high, uh, uh, there is actually a spin glass transition at a much lower temperature compared to the Curie-wise temperature. This happens at 3.5 Kelvin. But nonetheless, if uh, one actually uses some local probes like MUSR or other probes, to look at the local fluctuations of the spins in time, then one sees that there is persistent spin dynamics down to uh, 100 millikelvin, right? even though the glass transition temperature is 3.5 millikelvin. So the main point is that there is no sign of transition to a magnetic long, long range order state even here, but there is a coexistence of both dynamical, so fluctuating rapidly if you wish, or liquid-like degrees of freedom, and uh, frozen movements, okay? And there is no phase separation. Okay? So this is what happens in many experiments in uh, systems where you suspect uh, spin liquid behavior and eventually there's a phase transition at a much lower temperature. Okay? Good, so uh, the system which we'll concentrate on here is this uh, very well-known system called uh, spin ice. And uh, 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 the nice thing about this is, A, it's uh, theoretically very well understood for the zero disorder limit, and B, that there are nice experimental candidates where much of this physics is seen. Okay, so for a moment, let's just ignore this long-range dipolar term here. Okay, so this is nothing but the dipole-dipole interactions between two ideal point uh, dipoles, which we learn in our electrostatic or magnetostatic course. So let's just ignore that for a moment. So then this is nothing but a nearest neighbor Ising-like interaction on a three-dimensional lattice. So actually I forgot to mention that. 
So uh, these spin ice compounds live on these three-dimensional frustrated lattices. So this lattice in particular is made of uh, corner sharing uh, tetrahedra. So these are called, this is called the pyroclore lattice. And uh, the two-dimensional version of it, which is made of the uh, uh, corner sharing triangular units, is called the Kagome lattice. And both of these lattices uh, for simple spin Hamiltonians, uh, nearest neighbor Heisenberg couplings and so on, one would expect uh, uh, spin liquid behavior here because of the frustrated nature of the lattice. Okay? Uh, right. So here, suppose I just concentrate on the... Uh, uh, interaction here. So because of certain reasons of the crystal structure and single ion anisotropy in, in these kinds of compounds, what happens here is the following. First, the, spizzing, uh, the, the spin should be thought of as Ising degrees of freedom. But these Ising degrees of freedom here do not have a, if you wish, do not have a uniaxial uh, nature. So Imagine that you have a tetrahedron here and there's the centroid of the tetrahedron. So you just draw lines out of the centroid. Then these spins basically point in or out of these lines, okay? But they are, of course, Ising degrees of freedom because they have just these two uh, directions to uh, sort of uh, point in, right? So in or out, okay? And uh, the second thing is that uh, even though this is not uniaxial, this is completely consistent with all the symmetries of the pyroclore lattice. And in fact, in these situations, this is what exactly happens. Okay. Now, if you take the nearest neighbor problem, then it's very easy to find the ground state uh, of this problem. And in fact, that is what is the first thing you would do to try to understand the low temperature physics, right? So the ground state of the problem satisfies this two in, two out rule, where uh, any configuration of spins on the full pyrochrome lattice where each tetrahedron has two spins pointing in and two spins pointing out is a valid ground state. Okay? And uh, it turns out that there is an exponentially large number of such ground states and there is also a nice connection to the water ice problem and that's exactly why this thing is historically called spin ice. So this manifold of ground states which is exponentially large uh, in system size is actually uh, also called the ice manifold. Okay? So this ice manifold has very interesting properties. Uh, so let me just come to that. So the first property is because there's an extensively large number of ground states even at zero temperature, uh, uh, there's a finite entropy even at zero temperature. And that can be calculated uh, at least in an approximate manner rather easily and that was first done by Pauling way back in 1935 when he was thinking of the water ice problem. Because in this problem of water ice there is a lot of similarity with this problem because essentially there is an oxygen atom sitting and then there are two hydrogens which are covalent bonded to it and two, oxygen, uh, two hydrogens which are uh, hydrogen bonded to it. And again, if you see, there is a connection straight away with this problem of two in and two out. So Pauling was trying to understand the number of ways this can be done in water ice. Okay? So uh, another form, uh, so a formal way to see that uh, there should be an extensive entropy in this uh, ice manifold of states which satisfy two in and two out, uh, the rule, the previous rule that I said is, uh, suppose I give you any spin configuration, which is a possible valid spin configuration for uh, this uh, uh, ice manifold of states, right? Then all you need to do is to search for loops, okay? And the property of the loops is should, that they should be alternate in and out pointing spins, okay? And these loops can be short loops. In fact, on this lattice, this hexagonal loop is the shortest that you can draw. It could be a slightly bigger loop or it can be a very big loop. Okay, and then if you find such a loop, all you need to do is to just change the spins from up, down, up, down, up, down to the reverse, down, up, down, up, down, up, or you do something like that here. And that's, again, exactly another valid, uh, ice, uh, uh, valid state in the ice manifold. Okay, so it again satisfies the two in, two out rule. And uh, just from this, you can easily see that there is an extensive number of states here. Okay. Uh, it's slightly more complicated, but not much more, but I won't elaborate on that here, to calculate the spin-spin correlations in this manifold of states, okay? And then, once you do this calculation, you realize that the spin-spin correlations have a very nice uh, uh, structure in real space. 
So the structure is exactly like this, okay? This is the structure of spin-spin correlations in real space if I just think of this problem, okay? So the spin-spin correlations are dipolar in real space. And if you just take this function and Fourier transform, you get that, okay? Rather, you get uh, that because that's what I did to generate this figure on Mathematica, okay? And, uh, but this figure is not from Mathematica. This is from an experiment, okay? So you actually see that in experiments also. Okay, so this is the first point. You see that in experiments. And you also see this sort of residual entropy this, that Pauling predicted in experiments. So again, these two are in this dysposium titanate and holmium titanate, right? Okay, good. Okay, but an important point to remember here is that both for dysposium titanate and holmium titanate, if you actually look at the scale of the exchange interactions in this system, and you look at the size of your magnetic movement, you realize that your magnetic movements are sort of 10 Bohr magneton, and so they're basically 10 times larger than most magnetic movements that you would encounter, and that actually means that the dipolar interaction here is sort of 100 times larger than most dipolar interactions that you would encounter in a magnetic system. And if you then calculate the numbers, these dipolar interactions are extremely significant, and they are basically as significant as these interactions. Then the puzzle is, I was just telling you everything is very easy here, but then this term looks very nasty, so what do I do about this full problem? And why does the full problem mimic just this problem, right? Because this is a long range piece and looks rather ugly. So the solution of that, which I'll very quickly go over, uh, is uh, the following. So you can just map this original spin ice problem to a equivalent problem where you convert the spins into charges and then you immediately see the connection. So what do you do? Okay, so what you do is what we did uh, again in high school. So one way of thinking about spins which are perfect dipoles is you don't think of perfect dipoles, you think of approximate dipoles. So approximate dipoles are where there is a plus charge and a minus charge and they are separated by some length. and uh, Basically, if you look at a point which is relatively away from this dipole, then your electric field or magnetic field is completely equivalent to a point dipole, whereas if you go very close to it, you realize that it's not an ideal point dipole, right? So you can actually play the same game here. So the spins live on this uh, uh, pyrochlor lattice. But now imagine constructing a lattice out of these uh, dual points, which are the centers of the pyrochlor lattice. And that lattice is called the diamond lattice. And that's a bipartite lattice, as you can immediately see from this figure. So then, suppose there is uh, a spin like that here. You can just replace it by a dipole like that here, where one end of the chart sits here and another end sits here. And so if there's something like that, you can just say that the plus charge sits here and the minus charge sits here. If there's something like that, you just play the same game. So given a configuration of spins, you can easily convert it into a configuration of charges, right? There's a one-to-one -one conversion. Okay, then what that does is the following. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, this complicated looking term in terms of these charge degrees of freedom are nothing but charge-charge Coulomb interactions because uh, that's how you get dipole-dipole interactions from uh, Coulomb interactions. You just do a multipole expansion and that's what you get, right? Then there are other higher interactions like quadrupolar interactions and so on, but you can show that if you do this mapping of spins to charges, uh, essentially those interactions are very small and they only change the physics at some uh, very low temperatures. So the physics is basically captured uh, if you convert the spins into the charges, and the charges live on the dual diamond lattice, and A, they have a Coulombic interaction, the usual Coulombic interaction, and B, they have an on-site chemical potential delta, uh, uh, which basically, uh, uh, you can again, uh, okay, uh, this delta you can again choose suitably so that the short distance part of your interaction Hamiltonian is, correct, is captured correctly, and this form anyway uh, helps you capture the long distance part correctly, and then somehow due to that, uh, even the intermediate part, if you compare the energy of your original spin Hamiltonian to this Hamiltonian, the deviations are extremely small. So that's roughly how you play this trick, okay? 
So then this problem of spins gets converted into a problem of charges and these charges are sitting at a finite temperature if you wish and then you can in fact use many intuitions from uh, the debye huckel theory of plasma as well. Okay? Good. So then for these dysposium titanate and holmium titanates and these other compounds which show these spinized behaviors, what happens is this delta is reasonably big compared to this other scale. So then if you're at low temperature, it's clear that the ground state manifold is where this total charge, if you wish, is zero on each of these points, right? But that's nothing but your ice rule, right? Because uh, if the total charge is zero on each of these points, that means that there are two plus charges and two minus charges, which just means that there are uh, these two in two out rules, okay? So that means that the ground state manifold is the same. But then you can ask what happens at finite temperature because you're not considering a short range problem here. So you can just use this picture of uh, plasma I told you about and calculate some things, but I won't have time to show you that. And what you realize is something nice. If you started only with the short range problem, of course at zero temperature, the short range problem has pinch points. So here I'm just zooming on one of the pinch points in momentum space. Then when you heat it up at finite temperature, this pinch point singularity is removed which just means that the spin-spin correlations are exponentially decaying at uh, finite temperature. Whereas at zero temperature, there was an algebraic uh, decay. Okay. However, if you consider the long range interaction, then basically what happens is that these pinch points also survive at finite temperature. Now that's very easy to see at high temperature. At high temperature, you just do a high temperature expansion and then it's clear that the spin-spin correlation is proportional to your coupling, but your coupling is long range. But uh, this trick you cannot play at low temperature because uh, then it becomes much more messy. But then you can in, uh, extend this plasma picture which I didn't explain to you at low temperature and you can actually calculate certain things uh, including the extent of this discontinuity at finite temperature for the long range problem and the width of these scatterings in momentum space. So basically this line and this line are, so this blue line is along this direction and this red line is along this direction. This is called the nodal line, this is called the anti-nodal line. Uh, okay, so uh, basically this is this answer from this approximate plasma picture, these lines. And these dots are from exact numerics and there's no fitting parameter, but uh, you can see that even at the lattice level, this picture explains the microscopic physics very well. Okay, good. So that's the physics and that's what changes because you have long range interactions. Good. So now um, what happens if you introduce disorder here? So this previous part is reasonably well understood. So what happens if you have disorder here? So in fact, you can experimentally do this and people have already done that. So experimentally what you do is uh, instead of uh, uh, having all dysposium or all holmium, you introduce some bit of some non-magnetic ion, something like yttrium for example. And uh, then the basic picture is that uh, in your lattice, there's a certain finite fraction of these non-magnetic ions which just replace the magnetic ions. So you can think of them as holes. So then suppose you're in particular thinking of the low disorder limit. Now in the low disorder limit, uh, the most uh, important process you need to think of is where there is a hole which is shared by the two neighboring tetrahedra. And then it's clear that even at zero temperature, there's no way that you can satisfy ice rule because this guy has three spins and that guy has three spins. So it's impossible to satisfy the ice rule. So in general, even at zero temperature, you will either form a dipole like this so these are just these dumbbells which I'm redrawing. So either you'll form a dipole like this or you'll form a charge two monopole like this or a charge minus two monopole like that, right? But then you can easily imagine because this is like an electrostatic problem that the dipole is lower in energy compared to the monopole and you can estimate this energy gap which is something like this in terms of the microscopic parameters of your theory. And uh, then if you are at a temperature scale much lower than that, then basically it's much more favorable to have dipoles compared to monopoles. Uh, so uh, in fact, this plasma picture that I was mentioning to you about, you can use this even to understand the disordered problem at finite temperature, unless you are in the glass phase, and I'll talk about this glass phase later on, but I won't, uh, I won't have time to explain the physics 
at a temperature scale much higher than that. But there's a way to generalize the plasma picture. Basically, the generalization is that there is a two population kind of a thing where unless you are close to the uh, uh, impurity site or the vacancy site, uh, there is a certain cost of producing these monopoles, which is delta. And if you're near them, there's another different cost of producing this. And that's it. That just changes your uh, uh, charge density at a finite temperature in a certain way. And if you just take care of that, everything can be recalculated, even with the disordered problem. Okay. So now what happens when you go to reasonably low temperatures? So to the zeroth order, the picture is very simple. So all the sites which could satisfy, all these sites on the dual lattice which could satisfy the ice rule would do that. And all the other sites would uh, try to satisfy the best it could by forming dipoles. That's the picture, right? So this is exactly what I've shown here. These are your original spins. Then you go to this dumbbell picture. And then these are your dipoles. So at these uh, sites on the dual lattice, there is no vacancy floating around, so you just satisfy the ice rule. Whereas if you come here or here, then of course there's no way you can satisfy the ice rule. But now let's see something interesting. Uh, so this spin, which I have sort of knocked out, so this spin is the spin that you would have needed to satisfy ice rule here. But so now, of course, this is not there, so this is a missing spin. But then you just count the charges here, and you just count the charges here, and you'll see that that's exactly equivalent to the spin that you have knocked out, right? And so, uh, the physics is much more simple. If you think in terms of these missing spins or co-spins, which are effectively six spin degrees of freedom, and then they behave much in much the same way as the original spin degrees of freedom, right? And uh, if you remember, I also told you about these uh, closed loops in the Coulomb phase, right? So these spins here can also fluctuate, right? It's not that the, f the thing is dead here. It can also fluctuate in loop fluctuations, and you can even integrate that out, and you can generate an effective interactions between these coarse degrees of freedom. So these guys, even though they look like dipoles here, they are really six uh, spin objects. And the interactions between them is exactly like this, right? So this is your original dipolar interaction. And this is just this other renormalized piece that you get because you have integrated out the loops from here. So that's kind of nice because originally you had this problem where there were lots of spins and few holes sitting. Now you have mapped it on to a slightly simpler problem where everything else is gone, but you just have these randomly located uh, ghost spins, and the interactions between them are mediated like this, right? Now, this is a problem where there are spins randomly located, and uh, uh, they have some kind of a dipolar interaction. So you would imagine that uh, there is a spin glass phase here. But of course, as many of you may note, it's very hard to establish that there is a spin glass phase in anything, OK? Uh, so then. Uh, uh, what we, okay, so I'll go a bit quick because I can see that I don't have much time. So basically what you can show is that there is a thermodynamic phase transition at a certain well-defined uh, defined temperature below which the picture is the following. And you can in fact calculate all these crossover and uh, transition points in terms of the microscopic parameters of your theory. So below this tra uh, thermodynamic transition, what happens is the following. These co-spins, or these six spin degrees of freedom, they actually freeze into a glass, whereas the rest of the background spins keep fluctuating into a, in a Coulomb spin liquid. So this is an example of a phase where you have both glass degrees of freedom and uh, uh, spin liquid degrees of freedom. And you can sharply identify which is which. OK? Right. Uh, right. So, uh, uh, so this is roughly the physics. Now, you can ask what happens below the glass transition where these uh, spins are actually frozen. Uh, so there you can show that there is a crossover as you keep reducing the temperature into another phase where uh, these fluctuating spin degrees of freedom actually ultimately freeze into a random spin ice state. And uh, that's basically showing this competition between the glass degrees of freedom and the liquid degrees of freedom. And there is some interesting physics there, which I still don't completely understand, but uh, we can discuss about that later if anybody is interested. So the signatures, if you wish, are that in the glass degree of freedom below this TC, you can actually see the freezing of co-spins, and you can use various probes to detect that. 
In this entire phase, both in the fluctuating, uh, uh, fluctuating bulk and the frozen bulk phase, actually you see that those pinch points that I originally talked about, they actually survive. So you should see both this and that simultaneously. And the interplay between the liquid and the glass degrees of freedom, it actually comes uh, uh, because of this, uh, this physics, which I very quickly mentioned. And you can see it in the gradual but complete loss of Pauling entropy as you keep lowering in temperature here. But nonetheless, the pinch points would survive here. So OK, uh, in the few minutes, uh, OK, yeah. So in the few minutes that I have here, uh, uh, I would go over very quickly over some of the things. So, so you, you see, we reduce this problem of uh, many spins and few holes to a problem of few co-spins. But that problem is also a rather complicated interacting problem. So how do I establish that there is a glass phase transition and a spin glass there? So of course, one of the work horses here is Monte Carlo algorithms. Uh, uh, but it turns out, if you think about it uh, a bit, it turns out that uh, if you do a simple Monte Carlo, which is the state of the art here, you would just uh, completely miss the proper equilibrium physics. The reason for that is the following. If you just look at these color codes here, they just mean, so these are the different uh, random spins here. And uh, uh, colors like red or uh, well, I can't distinguish it from here, but anyway, red or orange or things like that mean that spins have a rather large flipping rate in your algorithm. Whereas these other guys, these blue and all, they have an extremely slow flipping rate in your algorithm. So these are like the frozen spins. And if you just write a conventional algorithm, then much of your bulk will just get stuck in some state and will never reach a thermal equilibrium. So Tushar came up with a very clever cluster algorithm. So these are some snapshots of the clusters. Whereas these are what we generated from just a local algorithm. And you can see that there is a almost one-to-one -one correspondence between his cluster and basically these slow degrees of freedom. So this is non-trivial because see, this problem is a frustrated magnet problem. So it's not obvious how you would write a cluster algorithm here, right? So, but it was pretty nice to come up with this thing and this was mainly his idea. So the upshot of that is the following. So as many of you in Mont know in Monte Carlo, there's something called the autocorrelation time. Basically, you need to run your simulations for a time at least greater than the autocorrelation time. Otherwise, uh, uh, you won't get the right physics. So this is the autocorrelation time of the conventional algorithm. And this blue line, this thick blue line, is the autocorrelation time from Tushar's algorithm. OK, so you can see, and this graph is on the log scale. So you can see the huge improvement in this algorithm. And therefore, we could get the physics correctly. OK, and um, sorry, I'm skipping over many details here. But if someone is interested, we can talk later. Because of all this, because of all this, we could simulate much larger system sizes. Here, it's impossible. Suppose you go here, then this guy will just crash the roof of this auditorium. And so it's impossible. But here, we could. So we could, in fact, establish here very carefully that there is a finite temperature phase transition here. In fact, many, so this phase transition is also interesting to the spin glass community. So there, were, there are many controversial things about these phase transitions. But at least our results seem to show that there is a finite temperature phase transition in three dimensions, A. And B, we can even do nice finite size scaling to estimate the critical exponents here. And so it seems that there is a continuous phase transition to a uh, interesting spin glass uh, phase here. There are also several interesting things about the dynamical correlations. I'll just take one minute maybe, uh, and I'll rush through it. So you see, this cluster algorithm is basically, if you think of it, is like a non-local dynamics, right? That's used to speed up your approach to equilibrium. Now, if you look at a real local dynamics, which is uh, presumably what you'll have in most experiments, then you again notice these formation of clusters, but through dynamical signature. So this is, if you wish, something like a dynamical heterogeneity. So what do I mean by that? So if, again, if you just look at the autocorrelation time of the spins, so these are very busy graphs. But you can immediately see that there's a huge variety of time scales here right, from the autocorrelations of the spins. And in fact, even if you go to a temperature of four times TC, for most short range models, that's like high temperature. But for these models, 
these dynamical heterogeneities survive. And in fact, you can clearly identify that looking at the autocorrelations and bunching them into separate bunches. And there's clear dynamical uh, clustering. And there is, uh, what we are trying to think of now is what is the connection of A, these dynamic clusters to the clusters we had in our Monte Carlo, and B, uh, these uh, dynamical clusters are also very different to the clusters which form in normal short-range spin glasses. So now we are trying to understand the physics of these, uh, uh, these uh, Griffiths phases in long-range systems through some simple toy models. Right? So, and there's uh, hopefully more to come here. And uh, I've already exceeded my time, so I would like to thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Uh, so questions? The, uh, the glass phase is um, have a long range interaction. Is it more like a replica symmetry breaking, or is it more like a Bruce Fisher? The, the, the... Right, right. So, uh, okay. This question I find always a bit tricky. So maybe uh, <laughs> maybe it's more like a replica symmetry breaking. But nonetheless, the important physical point is that uh, below this uh, TC, uh, actually you can establish that the even if you look at these spins dynamically, that there is a frozen moment. That's the most physical way of stating that there is a spin glass transition. But the order parameters we used in our simulations were things which characterize replica symmetry breaking, and they turn non-zero. Are there some, some models which are more, even more longer range, like these spin models where, you, where there's a, have you written down such models where there is a coexistence glassy degree of freedom and non-glassy degree of freedom? So this is one model like that, right? Because if you... analytically soluble, like the P-spin models are soluble. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Are there such models where such physics occurs? Uh, yeah, as far as I know, uh, as far as I know, one cannot cleanly show it analytically, but maybe there is. So yeah, I cannot immediately answer that question. Right. More questions? Uh, ask her. Are you implying that the um, without disorder, the system has some glassiness tendency some, with some characteristic scale? Even a small disorder can exactly. stabilize it. Exactly. So without disorder, you can analytically show that even though there's a tendency like that, there is no phase transition. So these acts like symmetry breaking fields. Exactly. When, whereas if you put disorder, immediately there's the symmetry breaking, and the transition temperature is proportional to the strength of the disorder. Yeah. Yes. So it's likely that if it is a symmetry breaking, that TC may bring out the intrinsic TC, which is much higher than the strength of. OK, we'll discuss it. Yeah. More questions? It's effective charge model you wrote down. Um, I'm wondering, can you do that for any choice of uh, the original parameters of the problem, or it's uh, you, oh. you got lucky and okay, okay, okay. Issue of right, right, right. Interaction so, and right. So if you remember, the original uh, problem was that there are dipolar interactions and there was some nearest neighbor term. So you can always write down this model for any. Oh, I have lost the model, uh, but I have regained it now. Yes. So you can always write it formally. But the nice thing is that for these experimental compounds, this delta is reasonably larger than this. That is what allowed you to make the statement that at very low temperature, you're still in the ice manifold. Because otherwise, there'll just be some crystallization of the charges and the anti-charges. Let's thank Arno.